Welcome to the last session for this uh, morning event. Uh, we'll be starting with uh, uh, a talk by Meg Schramb uh, about exploring Mars with 150,000 Earthlings. Hopefully everybody can see this and hear me. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I appreciate um, being able to give this talk remotely. So I'm going to really be talking about having 150,000 collaborators. I'm not really lying. Um, and so I want to give a sort of whirlwind talk, um, an overview of the Planet 4 Citizen Science Project and how we're using human pattern recognition to solve a problem that's been really in challenging to um, solve with computers. Um, but that might change, um, as I'll show you in my talk. So. A lot of times when you hear about Mars, you really think about it being incredibly Earth-like. Um, and we're gonna focus on the bits of Mars that are you know, rather different. Um, and so on here, you'll see that um, there's these very dark streaks um, that are present. And this is an image of the South Pole of Mars. Um, it is um, the best way to describe this is um, it's an area where there's carbon dioxide ice on the surface and we're seeing these dark um, fans on the top of the surface and they appear um, in the springtime and there's hundreds of thousands of these and so we think that they are telling us about um, the, the surface of, of Mars um, and it, its climate. So I, I think it's really important to think about um, how the and I'll Seems like it took away, but we'll start that again. There we go. Um, really trying to understand what this process tells us. And so we think it's actually happening is that there's carbon dioxide uh, geysers going off on the South Pole. And so we actually think we're seeing um, that there's a semi-translucent carbon dioxide ice sheet um, and that as the sun's right light penetrates um, in the springtime after the CO2 ice sheet has formed, um, you get trapped gas underneath a brittle ice sheet. And so, of course, what you expect is going to happen happens. The gas breaks out in any way possible, we think, as carbon dioxide jets. And we think during that process, and again, this ice isn't that thick. It's probably about a meter um, in, in thickness, probably is bringing up this dust and dirt with it as it moves, moves up through the ice sheet. Um, and that <clears throat> you can kind of see this here in that we see these sort of fans um, appear right and get further as we go into the, the, the spring and late summer. But by the time we get into full summer and there's clearly the temperatures are higher than carbon dioxide ice, we don't see fans anymore. And so it helps us think that we really are seeing what's like a frosted piece of glass, right? Um, that you're looking through. And so you've basically taken some of what's below that ice sheet and put it up to the surface um, while the ice sheet is there, which is why you see this color contrast. Um, in the dark fans and that once the ice is gone, the material just falls back down and we can't tell the difference. And so you might notice that there's looks like these channels that have been, might look like a spider. Um, and these are dubbed Araneiform. So we think that they are forming as part of this process of this carbon dioxide jet um, and um, seasonal fan depositing um, process. And it looks like they take eons to form. There are not a lot of images of new, um, fan, a new uh, Araneiforms forms forming, but we think it is part of this process that where you tend to find Araneiforms, forms, you tend to find lots more fans coming out of those channels, at least on the surface, although that the Araneiforms forms are actually below that ice sheet. So again, this is showing you a visual on the side here um, of what we think we're seeing. Um, and just to give that in a different way, this is showing it um, in a different schematic. And to prove that this actually can happen, here's going to the Kelso dunes and putting a slab of carbon dioxide ice down and you can see that on the edges, it is moving the fine particles. And so we do think that what we're seeing with these streaked features in the South Pole is this sort of fine grain material that's been brought up by the carbon dioxide gas as it breaks through the ice sheet. And I wanna highlight that um, because these things have directions, um, we can do things that potentially we've never been able to do, which is actually measure the surface winds of Mars, right? There's only a few things that we've had um, been able to measure at the surface, and that's usually landers and rovers. And so this is just an example of the different types of uh, measurements that have been made from pressure measurements from Viking to actually sticking plumb bobs on, on Phoenix um, to measure wind direction or watching which way the clouds are moving um, with the, the, some of the rovers. And so 
we don't have lots of areas on Mars that have wind measurements, unlike the Earth, right? Which is how we improve our global climate models. Um, and so we think that these, these fans really are showing the wind blown direction. Um, here's just showing two example images from the, from the high rise camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And just see here that these fans are bifurcated in a couple different directions. And so we think that is again, telling us about um, that the wind direction changed as the material was venting out. And then on the right, you see that these look very much like, you know, just spots maybe where the jet is coming up and then just pausing material below. So we think that this is again, something that can tell us about wind direction by looking at where we do see directionality and how it's changed and also how we see possibly where there are no directionality and that's maybe telling us that the wind wasn't strong enough to blow these, this material. Also, the thing that this is all come being driven by a sublimating ice sheet. And so Mars is a red planet. There's a lot of red dust in the atmosphere. Um, and that also is a part to play. Um, and so this ice sheet is semi-translucent. It is like frosted glass in that sense of it does have these particulates in it, embedded within it. And that may change how things outgas. And so just an example here on the left and the right are two different monitoring seasons from the high-rise camera to Mars reconnaissance orbiter. and um, it's the highest resolution camera we've sent to Mars, but it also had the luck of coming before, <laughs> right before a um, large global dust storm obscured the entire surface of Mars. And during that global dust storm, actually, is when the seasonal south polar cap was forming. And so that carbon dioxide ice that was being formed and deposited out of the atmosphere, it's about 30% of Mars, Mars's atmosphere, falls out or snows out to form that seasonal ice sheet. Um, that had the dust storm, which had so much dust in the atmosphere, you couldn't see down to the surface for weeks. And so this on the left is season one, that's before the dust storm. And over on the right is season two, that's post dust storm um, with the ice sheet that had um, the enhanced amount of dust within it. And so clearly you can see by eye, there's some differences. There's a lot more seasonal fans um, in season two, right, in that ice sheet that has a lot more dust in it. So again, we think that by measuring the number of fans, how much, how much the surface has changed in terms of albedo as we create these seasonal fans, probably is telling us something about this ice sheet and the Martian climate and how it responds, the Martian climate responds to these global dust storms. But you really need to actually measure all of this and say how much area has been covered and, and that actually has been tricky. Um, so you might argue this should be an easy machine learning problem, and it's apparently not. Um, so the high-rise team has tried this for a very long time, but this is just showing you a smattering of images from high-rise um, in different colors. And again, high-rise is the highest resolution camera ever sent to another world. It can see a coffee, si a coffee table sized object on, on the surface. Um, and you can just see here, there's a lot of colors and textures. And so while I'm talking, you probably easily spot where these are the dark, dark fans and identify those separate from the, the spider channel features. Um, but this is really difficult to make machines do because this is a very, these features are very, you know, they're, they're not sharp boundaries. And so that has made it very hard for any machine, any machine learning that's been thrown at this without having a large um, training set. And so part of the problem is to create a tra large training set. The problem when there's hundreds and thousands of these features, getting the team to even mark a few, <laughs> few hundred subframes of a high rise image took, took months. So this is, you know, when there's hundreds of thousands of these fans, we're kind of stuck in a, we don't have a training set yet to use machine learning on and other automated techniques we're not doing as well as what people could do by eye. So that sort of led to this process of joining with the Zooniverse. And so I'm showing you on the, the, the left, the Planet 4 science team, um, the Zooniverse team, and really highlight that Zooniverse is the largest platform for citizen science, um, for online citizen science in the world. Um, and it really enables being able to go and in their platform, I highly recommend go taking a look, but with their project builder tool in 30 minutes, you can have, or less, you can have your own citizen science project. You might be arguing more over what task you want rather than actually being able to set it up. And so I think that's one of the powers of their platform now and what they've grown into. Um, and so I'll highlight the fact that we partnered with them to, to solve this problem by asking people to mark these, these fans. Um, and so we have 30 people look at a high rise subtitle. It's about 800 by 600 pixels. Um, and so we asked people to go and mark with the ice cream cone feature, the directions of the fans and blotches, because we care about the directions for the wind 
you know, when we want uh, wind measurements um, and we care about getting as many of the features as possible to figure out how much material was outgassed, again, to look at that, how things change, right, with that, that ice sheet and its properties. So you can go to planetforward.org. We're live with data now um, if you get bored in this talk. But the idea being is that we actually can combine those classifications of what's known as the wisdom of crowds. So this has been around for a while. If you've heard of Galaxy Zoo, it's exactly the same thing. We just have a little bit more complication of that these are actually more spatial features. And so we apply a, a sort of a pipeline and a classification scheme that takes um, using clustering effectively um, to cluster these sources. And so all we're doing is clustering the positions of the fan and blotch drawings of 30 people look at each image. And so we take their class, individual classifications and we combine them together. And so then if there is a fan feature and a blotch feature, because we cluster them separately, we figure out where they're overlapping. And then based on the majority vote, we decide whether the feature that these people marked is a fan or a blotch effectively. Um, and then we're going to ground project that. And so all we're doing is sort of going through this process of figuring out what our, our fans and blotches are and then looking at whether, you know, um, where they overlap, which one we believe more. And again, you can, we have data that you can choose that if your definition is different than mine, you can, you can go back in our data and create the best sample that you want. So, you know, I'll show you here. It's just it's detailed in um, A&L 2019, but the idea being is we take the base position, the edge of that ice cream cone and the center of the ellipse and we use that to basically cluster with some looking at some of the angles um, and positioning, mainly for both, uh, mainly for the ice cream cone feature, but also for the the ellipse, um, and then go through looking at the overlapping features. And so by doing this, we're not looking at one person; we're taking the majority effective vote. <laughs> Um, and so for us, we say that if any feature, um, if 50% or more of the volunteers identify it as being a fan, then we keep that as a fan. If, or, um, and again, it takes at least three volunteers to have marked the same feature for us to identify it as being a source. Um, and so we've gone through and used this pipeline and um, been able to take all of our classifications, use that wisdom of crowd effect, and be able to... to actually create a catalog of these seasonal fans and blotches. The largest that's ever been produced for looking at Mars and, and this, this, um, these features. So I just wanna highlight that proof in the pudding. I can tell you that that works, but we, I should be able to back that up. And so let me just show you here, this is a sub image from High Rise. Again, this is one tile we call it in Planet 4 that we had volunteers mark. Um, and so in here, you'll see these are all the fan uh, and blotch marking. This is rather all the fan markings from the volunteers. Different color represents a different volunteer. Um, and then over here, that image next to it is all the blotches. Again, different color, different volunteer. And so again, the same sources are identified, right, as both uh, with a blotch tool and a fan tool. Um, and so when we use our clustering, again, treating these separately for the moment, we get this image down here and this image down here, again, identifying most of the features. And then we look at the majority vote and see who's, how many volunteers drew the fan versus the, the blotch um, or contributed to the final clustered you know, fan features and blotch features. And so at the end, we get this, this here. So overall, we're getting all of the features in just this example, right? We're getting directionality and also sometimes, occasionally we'll also get you know, a mixture of identifying these features as as fans, but also, again, if there's a larger feature marked, in this case, a lot of people were drawing circles around all three of these, that will pop up as well. Um, so we've been able to use this catalog to basically now be able to look at directionality and understanding how this can tell us about the Martian climate. Um, but before I get into that, again, I want to show more proof of the pudding. And so this is just taking a random high-rise sub-image and showing you here this rose diagram, which is telling you which way we think from our catalog the fans are pointed. And so again, we think they're pointing from sort of bottom corner, <laughs> bottom right corner to top left. Um, and again, you see that here, that these fans are mostly going in that direction. Okay, so I showed you a couple of plots. You might not argue that that's proof. And so one of the things that has been taken a lot of time is to prove that this, this volunteer's combined assessment is as good as the experts. And so here I'm just showing briefly, these are three of the science team, here's me, so you can see how bad or good I am compared to the catalog. But the idea is you can, we've taken a random, about 200 um, of these tiles. Um, so again, sort of an image like this and had the science team mark them. Um, and so we're individually in blue and the catalog is in orange and we have number of fans plotted versus the fan length. 
And so overall, the variation between all three of us um, is is the, the the science team <laughs> is that we don't agree 100 percent, right? We vary amongst ourselves in terms of our analysis. And so, but overall, even with the catalog, there is some variation, but it's very similar to the variation between the three experts. And so the highlight and point of this, and the paper goes into way more detail, is that the catalog is just as good as the as us as on the science team marking this, and they got it done way faster. Um, it took months to get even just a 200 images, and we have thousands of images on the site that people are um, analyzing. And so on the right, I can show you, you know, that's looking at fan lengths. Well, what about directionality? And so here is looking at a, a histogram showing the difference if you take the average direction of these fans and, and these sub, small sub images and you compare what the expert had for that image versus the, the catalog. And we're, we're matched within about 10 degrees. And so we think that's pretty good um, proof that combining the assessments of multiple non-expert volunteers in this case with this online citizen science project is getting us results that we can actually use for science. So at the end of the day, what we've gotten out of this is that we've looked at, uh, we've gotten 160,000 fan measurements and 250,000 blotches effectively identified, which means we have directionality and we have the ability of knowing their shapes and locations to be able to look at how much of the, the ice sheet gets coated in the darker albedo. Um, and so again, this was 42, or roughly 43,000, these sub images that were viewed by volunteers. Um, and so that's how we're, you know, get our 150,000 volunteers, right, are coming from people looking at these um, these images. And again, each each image getting about 20 to 30 um, classifications um, or individual assessments. So the tiles are come from about 221 high-rise images that we looked at over two Martian years, covering about 28 regions of history of some South Pole. So this is the power of this, is that we're able to be able to get um, really into the meat of being able to look at different regions because we've had the ability to process this data so quickly. Um, and, you know, again, there's still no, we now have a set that we could use for machine learning or automated routines. Um, and we'll, I'll really touch on them briefly at the end. But here I'm just showing you the, the different locations or regions of interest that HiRISE have looked at for those two Mars years. Um, and here is just showing you Elsa Best or season on Mars, basically, it's it's, time, it's location in its orbit around the sun, but it tells you about season. So we're starting here in southern spring and going to southern summer. Um, and here we're showing it in latitude um, and just showing you Mars years two, the, the season two and season three, the modern campaign. And all I want you to get out of this is that we cover a wide range of, latitu of, of latitudes um, and that there is very good seasonal coverage. And here is a safe mode event by our poor um, spacecraft not being able to observe. But while the spacecraft is observing, we're, you know, we've been able to get data pretty frequently. So now what we have the beauty of doing from having these classifications is actually able to look at how the wind direction has changed over time. So on the top, I'm showing you Mars year, that seasonal season two, um, and showing you early spring and sort of late spring breaking that um, the wind directions into. And doing the same for the same region, um, blocked into the, the next year, into early spring and late spring. And all I want you to get across here is that by having all of these individual measurements, what we actually can start seeing is that the wind started over here and has been slowly marching um, over to this side. And so that we're actually now starting to see proof that the wind directions are changing. Um, and that if they, if they were actually, the, the fans are being continually renewed in the same direction, then we'd actually see lag of seeing these features here and remain here, right, for a while as we kept moving. And you'll see that these colors represent the different images at different times. And that is very cleanly, we see early, the various early spring image and that those, that directions are gone as we get, move over to the next ones. And same thing in late spring, you don't see any of the, any of the fans that are over in this direction. So we've gone from being really data poor to being data rich. Um, and so I'll highlight just some of the brief results that have come out in our latest paper, sort of buying have this ability to having so many volunteers looking at the data and combining it together um, in ways we couldn't do before. Um, so one example here is showing a region we've dubbed Macclesfield. Um, and so we're showing the fan direction here um, versus the, 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 the fraction of the total number of fans in the image. And then on the, the second plot is showing the fan length um, and again, that fractional coverage. And so this is the sort of season two, and this is season three um, of those two campaigns. And all I want to get across is that 
you can actually see the winds bifurcate here um, as we go from early spring all the way down to late spring. And each one of these plots is for a high rise image where we've had those, those catalog markings right from planet four. And so again, you can see season two and season three have differences, but we can see that the winds actually bifurcated much earlier here um, uh, in, in season three. So we don't fully understand what's going on, but we actually now have this really important starting of wind measurements, right? And directionality on the South Pole of Mars over a wide range of, of latitudes and longitudes. And so what we're getting into is actually starting to compare and trying to understand what is the wind directions actually telling us by comparing to climate models. And so we're using MRAMS, which is a modeling system that puts down a high resolution grid down on the South Pole. So this is just showing a schematic of that on the left and right. This is the larger grid. And then nested within that is higher resolution grids that is using as good a topography as we have. And each one of those dots is one of the locations where we have high rise measurements and have planet four catalog. So I'll, I'll just wrap up by showing a couple of results and then touch briefly on machine learning. And so what I want to highlight is that, you know, we, one of these regions called Giza, we see that the wind directions are clearly changing. Um, and that, again, we're, we're seeing a little bit of what's going on as we go through the, the, the season. But we can compare that to the, the model. And here's actually showing three, three Mars days because the, res the model is so complex and takes so long to run that effectively, even after weeks and weeks and weeks, we get three <laughs> Martian souls. Um, they're each different. But what I want to highlight is that we're plotting the sort of season on, on Mars down here um, versus the, the directionality. There's also... Uh, you know, each plot tells you about speed individually, but each one of these is a different snapshot of season from early spring to the start of summer. And all I want to get across is that each one of these red lines is telling us a planet for average measurement of the wind direction. Um, we can look at speed, but there are, there's some uncertainty because we have to estimate particle size from, from orbit. But, I, but what the model is showing in blue is where it thinks it gets wind directions from the upper atmosphere and, and black, rather the lower atmosphere and black being the higher atmosphere. And all I want you to get across is there are times when our wind directions at least match with the model. There is some wind produced by the model at the surface that could be producing what we see from the fans. And so I think that's exciting that for the first time we're actually able to take these observations. Um, and sort of match um, the fan directions to a model. And we at least can say, overall, it's fairly consistent. There's some blaring you know, issues sometimes, such as we have measurements down here, and this, this day doesn't seem to represent that, but these other two days from the model do create that sort of the location for those winds. So again, this is sort of maybe we're at the crude step and we can look at another area and again, see something similar that we're seeing, you know, again, that directionality um, where the fans are directed, right? The expected wind direction we would take out from uh, would need to produce those. We seem to be able to create in these in these climate models, um, and that we're also starting to see where where climate matters <laughs> and where topography matters. And so this is just showing um, basically an evolution uh, a topography map and showing our planet four wind directions on top of it. Um, and showing you those two regions. So you can see here from Manhattan, all I want to get across is that there's a valley in here and that's clearly driving lots of the, the, the dynamics in the winds. And we still do pretty well in mapping what we see in Planet 4 to that climate model. So it seems like what we're getting in terms of the wind measurements and sort of the broad strokes of, of, these, climate, of these weather models is that they're matching. Um, and that although we have the high, really high resolution imagery, the topography that's going into these models it, it isn't very high resolution. Um, and so it seems like it's the bulk features right now of the topography that are driving the, the catabatic winds and, and the dominant winds. So this is the first time we've actually been able to measure for a large area of Mars, these wind directions from citizen science. Um, perfect. And so what I'm going to end with right now is really just talking about machine learning and that we've just started to be able to look at um, machine learning. Um, and what we're finding is that certain clustering techniques don't work. CNNs are okay. But what they've failed to do is actually get directionality. So every machine learning expert that we've worked with has failed to get directions of the fans and blotches. What they can do is find them. And so the best we've been able to do so far in a paper we just submitted to Icarus 
is look as basically have a CNN that can sort of one of these neural networks that is actually able to identify from the Planet 4 catalog being trained on it where the, the sources are. And so here, just to show you that, I'll go back one. Um, here is to show you that on the left, you've got in the small image, um, you've got here, you've got the Planet 4 catalog, and on the right is the CNN. And it does pretty good at least identifying the sources. Um, but overall, right, when we look at these techniques, and this is too showing a, in the, the left plot is showing um, the difference between recall and precision for the, this clustering algorithm that was tried, this automated model, as well as um, the CNN. And so all I want to show here is that we want to be up in this corner, right? That precision is telling you what, you know, out of the stuff that you found that you, you predict to be real or fans, you know, how many of them are actually real fans. And then same thing, recall is telling you about sort of on the opposite side, right? It's telling you about out of your actual positive data, how many times you got that right. Right, and you want to be in the top corner here. And so these are each different locations um, on Mars that we had high-rise imaging in. And though, so most of the time you get you get into this corner. Um, and again, the larger dot is just saying it had a better value for the dice, uh, a dice metric that it was using, the coefficient was using to again look at another way of looking at how well the machine learning algorithm was doing. So clustering didn't do as well. It often got confused, which is why it's more down here. But we did in several cases get into that corner for um, the CNN. So it's still not good at actually getting directionality. So we still need people. So I'll say, it, just to wrap up, is that um, Planet 4 relaunched on the News Universe um, Project Builder platform um, last year. So it's continuing to go strong. We still have lots of data to get through. And we need more data to be able to um, identify um, these seasonal fans and blotches and get directionality because we still yet don't have a machine learning algorithm or an automated way to, to identify directionality yet. Um, it's also spawned several to, uh, several other projects, which we now um, keep all together at planet4.space. Some of them have data right now, some of them don't. Um, but I'll leave up my conclusions, and I'm happy to take any questions. So thanks very much. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Meg. Uh, we've, got, we've actually got quite a few questions on the live questions. Uh, the first one is by Peter Teuben. Are you keeping track how long users typically endure doing this tedious work? Uh, what's the, uh, their attention span, in other words? Um, it's as much as the regular internet. <laughs> um, so, it, it's, so typical values for the Zooniverse are about the same as people's attention on Wikipedia. So most people do a few. About 80% of the classifications are done by 20% of the volunteers. Our task is harder, so we definitely see that there's less people doing hours and doing it, um, doing it for long periods of time. I haven't looked in a while, but it's yeah, it's 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 the typical average span of a human being on the internet. So it's very quick; it's minutes. Um, if it, we're lucky, if we get longer than that. Right. Uh, then, uh, well, uh, are, are more seasons planned uh, by Kathleen Lebry? I'm not sure whether we're talking about observations or, or about analyzing the observations, but it looks like you've got more, much more data to sift through. So Yes, so as long as High Rise is still observing, um, they do a seasonal South Polar campaign each year. So we've gone through about four seasons now. Um, and we're processing more. So we're sort of science team limited now, which is, which is great to be in. Um, we need more people, I think, to work on the, on the data, interpretation of the data. But yeah, we've now reached launch site and um, we're working on, on getting through the next several seasons. So knock on wood that High Rise is the only camera that really can see these fans and watches in that much detail. So there's no replacement for it right now. So we hope it hangs on for, for another decade, or if it can. Okay, then there are a few, well, uh, we don't have an awful lot of time, so I'll uh, defer, I mean, some of the questions about how you credit the contribution of uh, 100,000 earthlings in your papers to the dedicated channel. But uh, I'll, ask, uh, I'll ask this question about, uh, from Michelle Lochner, who just came through, which I think is interesting. Uh, since I'm into anomalies, was there any flexibility in the interface for users to indicate anything weird they find, which is neither a fan nor a blotch? Absolutely. In the old version, we had something called interesting. Um, and it was that they could put a star on anything. And we found that they didn't use it very often because they didn't know what to put. Um, and so although it's fine to give something like that, I, I think what we found is that um, you have to tell help people figure out what, what is interesting or what is an anomaly for them to understand it. Um, so for us, we didn't get much out of that interesting feature. Um, 
but the discussion tool helps with that. There's a discussion tool with all of these. And that sometimes we could get people talking about it and they could add their own hashtags or labels. And that helps because then they can describe something in their own way. So, but in the interface, uh, we couldn't find any anomalies very easily with, with the classification interfaces, interesting feature. So we actually dropped that in the, in the newest version of Planet 4. Thanks. There are uh, a few more questions that I'll defer to the dedicated channel, but uh, uh, I think uh, we need to move on. Thanks again, Meg. I mean, that was uh, extremely interesting uh, for us Earthlings. <laughs> Thanks.